Good morning, Deliverance Church in Zambia, and welcome to part two of update uh, on the end times. Uh, once again, I'm Dr. James Magara. I come from Kerry Hill Deliverance Church, and it's a great uh, pleasure for me to be sharing with you today uh, my understanding of what the Bible teaches about the end time. In the first part of this message, we spoke, we gave a background of God's plan from the earth, beginning from the book of Genesis, coming the time of Christ and uh, the time of the resurrection, and indicated that while the disciples expected to see the Lord come and basically deal with the enemies, bring the age of God, this age, the present, the, 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 the age to come, bring it fully once in one big bang and splash, uh, we saw that God had, had, had other plans. That plan included uh, us, that we too would be part of seeing this whole story come to fullness. So today we are looking at part two, talking about the return of Christ, uh, which is a mark of the end of the age. And uh, this is the most eagerly anticipated event in the church calendar. And uh, also a matter that has been very, very divisive uh, for Christians, especially in the last 200 years. And one of the major questions when we look at the question of the end time is, who will have the abound when Christ returns? Will it be the devil? Will it be God? At the point when Christ returns, who will have the upper hand, the devil or God? Now, I introduced last week the teaching of dispensationalism, which has dominated the church for the last 200 years. And that teaching teaches that the devil will have the upper hand. And that it's a teaching that has spread a lot of pessimism. Uh, before that, the church was very forward looking. It was advancing the kingdom. Missionaries were leaving Europe to go and they knew, many of them moved their coffins. They knew they were not going to go back. Uh, but they knew that they would give their lives for the, for the sake of the kingdom. Um, and the kingdom would move into the dark territories until it reigned over the earth. But dispensationalism has had a negative impact on the church. Um, the sense that uh, the church is preparing to, read, to, escape, to escape. Now, just need to remind us that our Lord taught us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come okay thy kingdom come not not may we come to your kingdom your kingdom come may your kingdom come on the earth as it is in heaven that's a prayer that we've prayed for two almost two thousand years from the time jesus taught that prayer to the disciples may thy kingdom come on the earth so this kingdom of god thing has to do with god's kingdom coming on the earth not 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 us escaping from the earth and uh, I just want to begin by talking about what the Bible teaches about the return of Christ and the state of the church, what I believe is the state of the church at the return of Christ. And I'll begin by reading Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 to 27. It says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water, with the word. It's what Jesus came to do. Uh, he gave himself. He came for a bride. Christ came for a bride, which is his church. He gave himself uh, and uh, he sanctifies her, us, cleanses her with the washing of the water, with the word. So that, so that, so that, what is the end result of what Christ is doing? That he may present the church to himself. Okay? This is like a bridegroom waiting for the bride on the wedding day to be presented. Okay? And this bridegroom that is being presented to Christ is without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Now, this gives me a picture of a church that has matured. You know, if, if you came for a wedding in church here, and uh, as you came, you're wondering, who's the bride? Who's the bride? And lo and behold, you see a fully grown man, and the bride is a 12-year-old. What would you do? Wouldn't you gasp, you know? Or... If you were in church and you see a, this young man, 25 years of age, and you look and lo and behold, an 80-year-old woman is walking in. You know? So the church that Christ is coming for will be in the prime of her beauty. It will be the church which has God is working on the church. He's been working on the church for 2,000 years. When you look at church history, the church started off with a lot of power, a lot of persecution, then the church declined. For a thousand years, the church declined. And the last 500 years, God has been restoring the church. D 
century by century, mid initially, but now decade by decade. And now with communication around the world, things are moving so fast compared to what they used to be. God is perfecting his church. And when that day comes, I believe the church that is coming is not a church that is so beaten and worn down, you know, basically on life support, as some people teach. Yeah? It's a church that is mature. It will also be a church that is united. How do I know this? John chapter 17, verse 20. Jesus himself was praying for his disciples. John 17, 20, and he says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in, them, in me through their word that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them just even as you loved me. So this was the last prayer of our Lord. And his desire was that we would be one. We'll be one. Now, it's 2,000 years later. God is answering that prayer. The church has been so divided, but God is answering that prayer. I don't believe that the church at the end of the age will be one that is uh, divided. I believe it's one that will have this prayer. This was the last prayer of the, of the Father, of the Son to the Father. It's going to be answered. And today we've seen movements in the, in the past uh, decades, recent decades, we've seen movements. I don't believe it's saying that we'll be in one church building. No, there's no way that millions of people can, 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 can fit in one organization. But the spirit of the unity in the bond of peace is returning to the body of Christ. Um, so I believe that is also a picture of the church at the end of the age. I believe the church will be powerful as well. Remember, when Jesus rose from the dead, before he died, he was talking about the kingdom, the kingdom. And the disciples, as I shared last week, were expecting that this political thing would come rolling in, you know. Uh, Jesus would come in, maybe signal some angels to come down and basically drive the Romans out. They were, they were so convinced. Jesus, unfortunately, dies. But then, to their utter amazement, he rises from the dead. And they touch him, they eat with him, they know he's alive. Forty days he appeared. And the Bible tells us that with uh, irrefutable proof, it was not like they saw a ghost or someone had a dream that I saw a risen Lord. No, 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 no. At one point, uh, uh, Paul tells us he appeared to 500 people at once. Now, if 500 people are seeing the same thing and hearing the same thing, it has to be real. So these men were so sure that the Lord had risen. Day number 40, he actually goes up and they are gazing as he goes. But as the time went on during those 40 days, one time they couldn't resist it anymore. They said, okay, you've died, you've risen from the dead. When is the big thing coming? When? And so they ask in Acts chapter 1 verse 7 uh, or verse 6, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Because we're getting confused. Why isn't he making a move? Okay, now he's risen from the dead. Why isn't he making the big move? So they ask, when, when is this thing going to happen? When, when, are you, when are you going to restore the kingdom? So he says in verse 7, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons of the fathers fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and to the ends of the earth. So now the disciples understand there's another agenda. Another agenda is going to come with power. And sure enough, 10 days later, on the day of Pentecost, the Jewish feast of Pentecost, 10 days later, the Holy Spirit comes, they're endued with power, they speak with other tongues, there are tongues of fire on their heads, there's the sound of a mighty rushing wind. Peter stands up to preach and preaches so powerfully that 3,000 people get saved on that day. And the church begins to grow. And uh, they were still very inward looking. They thought this thing is only for the Jews. And yet Jesus had said they would go to the ends of the earth. So God has to send persecution to disperse them. Um, and uh, now the church lost its power. As I mentioned uh, last week, in the first 300 years of the church, the church was still powerful. Though it was persecuted, they were still witnessing the, the Pentecost of fire, Pentecost of power. But when the church was given liberty, 313 AD, by Constantine, Galerian and Constantine, uh, the church was allowed to be free and the church began to decline. As the church went into prosperity and got into power, the church went into a time of decline. But God has been restoring the church. And the last 500 years, there have been many waves of restoration. 100 years ago, God brought Pentecost back. In Azusa Street, the Pentecostal movement started 
the fastest praying movement of the church in the, in the history of the church. Uh, God is not through yet. It's not through yet. God is still bringing waves of restoration and renewal. So it will be a powerful church, the church that Jesus returns for. It will be a glorious church as well. I believe Isaiah 60, though it speaks about Israel, talks about the church as well. There, I think there's a picture there. It's talking about the restoration of Israel. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Now look at the next words. For it says, For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the people. In the context of darkness covering the earth, and the darkness is not talking about absence of sunlight, no. It's talking about people who are so moved away from God that it's like a darkness. Their understanding is darkened. They are doing wicked things. Now, in that context, where there's darkness in the earth and there's deep darkness with the people. And I don't think any of us really doubts that we are seeing darkness creeping across the face of the earth. When we see the kind of things that are being permitted now, that they are being forced to become law, there is darkness on the earth. But in that context, in that context, it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. So I personally believe that at the end of the age, you shall see two pictures. We shall see a lot of evil and wickedness, shocking things happening in the world. But at the same time, the light of Christ will be arising on the shine on the on the on the on his people. It says, But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen on you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. That's the picture that I see. Yes, there are accounts in the scriptures about uh, terrible things that will happen, but I see that at the same time, according to Isaiah 60, when there is thick darkness on the earth, on the whole earth, not just in one portion, one continent, on the whole earth. There's darkness covering the earth, and there's thick darkness covering the peoples who live on the earth. Uh, so things happening on the earth, and things happening among the people who live on the earth. At that time, God arises on his, on his people, and uh, their brightness begins to be seen in sharp contrast to darkness. So that's another picture that I believe uh, we'll see at the end of the age. Uh, it will be a glorious church. And uh, now, what will be the nature of the end? 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 to 17, uh, we are told about the cry of the archangel. The archangel will cry, uh, and as Christ uh, will descend, the dead in Christ will rise fast. By the way, that's a, that's a very clear statement in the scriptures. When we talk about the rapture, the escape thing has been so much about us getting away. But the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise fast. So we're looking forward to this great event uh, called the resurrection. And those who are alive will join him to meet him in the air. And this is where the rapture thinking comes from. But what it doesn't answer is when you meet him in the air, where are you going? He says, we shall be with him forever. So when you meet him in the air, are we continuing to go back with him in heaven or is, are we meeting him to come back on the earth? That's a big question. Uh, we are told believers will receive their resurrection bodies and there are a lot of scriptures that talk about that. Uh, there will be punishment for the right, reward for the righteous and punishment for the unrighteous. Eventually, the devil is destroyed in the new heaven, a renewed earth. Now, let us talk a bit about the nature of this end game. What will you look at? First of all, you remember on the day of the ascension, when the disciples were intently looking at Jesus leaving them, going up with the clouds. Two men appeared, the book of Acts chapter 1. Two men appeared and they said, this same Jesus will return in the same way that you saw him go. So, some very straightforward things there. Number one, Jesus went up physically. He didn't, he didn't go up in a dream that 1,000 people dreamt he was going up. No, no, no. They were in a physical place on the Mount of Olives. And they physically saw him go. He will physically return. He said in the same way. So, there's no question about that. The scriptures are very clear. We are looking forward to a bodily return, bodily. Just like he appeared for 40 days and they could see him and touch him and eat with him and so on, he will appear bodily. Number two, the end of the age will be characterized with a, will be very public. His return will be very, very public. Okay? As I said last week, I'm avoiding going into so-and-so is the Antichrist. Look at what's happening in Europe. Look at what's happening in China. No, I'm not going in that direction. But I want to bring out the fact that there are some established facts. Uh, in Luke 17, 24, it talks about as lightning strikes from east to west. It will be so visible. It will not be like, have you had? Have you had? Have you seen the WhatsApp message? 
someone called Jesus has arrived in Jerusalem, you know? And then it will not be that kind of stuff. No, no, it will, whatever it is, we do not know the details. Remember, we don't know all the details, how it will happen, we do not know. But when it happens, there will be no question in anyone's mind that this event has happened to be public. And then we also hear about the cry of the archangel. There will be a cry of the archangel. That cry is a cry that all the dead in Christ are waiting for. It's the cry of the archangel which will activate the resurrection. I believe that archangel is Michael. When he blows that trumpet of the resurrection, the dead in Christ will get back their bodies. I mean, it's an exciting thing to think about. And uh, those of us who are alive, I pray I'll still be alive at that time. Uh, our bodies will be quickened and we'll get new bodies. Jesus ascends and the dead in Christ rise. Those who are alive join to meet him in the clouds and uh, we receive our resurrection bodies. And there's a reward. I've already talked about the reward for the righteousness and uh, punishment for the wicked. So let's talk a bit more about the nature of this return. Um, just give me a minute to update with my notes. Okay, so I'll be with him forever. Now there are some words that I need to bring out that are used. The most common word used for the return of the word, the Lord, is the Greek word parousia. Parousia. What does it mean? What is the original meaning of the Greek word parousia? It means arrival. It means presence. It means active, continuing presence. And it's used in a number of scriptures. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. Just note this down. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. 1 John 2, 28. And James chapter 5, verse 7. Okay? Arrival, presence. Now, in order to understand this word, we need to understand the context in which Paul used it. In those days, uh, they used to, what, what you, because Rome needed a very large army to conquer the world. Now, when you have a large army, you have another problem at time. Because when you have a large army, it means every year, at some point, so many soldiers are, are retiring from the army. And uh, if they don't, you don't want them coming back into Rome because they, you'll end up with a lot of idle, and idle soldiers who could cause trouble. So what the Roman emperors did was to set up Roman cities. Uh, Thessalonica was a Roman city. Colossia was a Roman city. Um, uh, Caesarea was a Roman city. So they would take these people, the retired citizens of Rome, and move them into these cities. So you had, uh, they didn't move the people of Rome uh, most conquering kings like Nebuchadnezzar captured people and took them back to his empire. But the Romans did something different. They came and settled they, they, and uh, dominated places, but then they allowed the people to stay in their places, but they brought their culture into that place. And so from time to time, the Roman emperor would visit. Okay? The Roman emperor would visit. So when the Roman emperor visited, well, guess what would happen? It's a bit like we've experienced here. I think the most, uh, the biggest thing we experienced here was a visit of uh, maybe the Pope or visit of the, of the Queen of England. What did we do? When the Queen arrived, all the dignitaries went to meet her at the airport. Okay? And then they would bring her into Munyonyo. Okay? Now, in those days, if a Roman emperor visited, uh, the, the, the Roman citizens would know the emperor is coming so they would go to receive the emperor and then they would come back into the city. They wouldn't go to receive the emperor to go to Rome. No, they would come back into the city and when the, when the, when the Roman emperor, emperor was in the city, they would say, we're experiencing the parousia, the presence of the Roman empire. He's in our midst. Okay, That's the meaning of the word parousia. Okay, so you need to understand when Paul used that word, he used it to, he wrote it to people uh, and uh, as, they, as they use it, they talk about the presence of the Lord, the return of the Lord, and His continuing presence in our midst. There's another word used called um, epiph epiphania, which is uh, talking about shining forth. It's used for both for His first and second coming. Okay? And then there's another word as well, uh, the word apocalypse. apocalypse. So the, the teaching of the rapture was teaching that we will be taken away. And this is a dispensationalism. At another time, I would like to take a more, much more time teaching about how the teaching of dispensationalism started uh, in Scotland and how it spread through England and then spread through America and began to dominate Christian thinking and its impact on Christianity. I believe God is uh, correcting a number of things that we have not, um, we have not, uh, uh, we've not been able to, to, to understand properly. Okay. So, um, 
what do I believe as now I begin to see what are some of the things that show us that we may well be living in the very last of the last days, the end of the end of days. <laughs> uh, I think for us to appreciate this, I'd like us to uh, look at the book of Daniel. And uh, I'll just open the book of Daniel. Just give me a minute to do that. And see some of the things that God allowed Daniel to see that, that we are seeing very evident in our time. Remember Daniel was a prophet who was shown, uh, given an interpretation of the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar and was shown the succeeding world empires and how they would uh, unfold over time. Now, in, the, in, the, in, in Daniel chapter 12, uh, let, us, let, us, let us read what it says here. Daniel chapter 12. He saw things that were way ahead of his time, and he would look at these things and just wonder, what are all these things about? But God found a servant he could entrust to write these things and let them let us know. So he says, at that time, that's the time of the end, that's what he says in the book of Daniel chapter 12, Michael, the great priest who has charge of your people, um, and um, not at, that, at, the, at that time shall arise Michael, the great priest who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people will be delivered. So the, it promises us that as we come to the end of age, there will be trouble. And I believe these troubles are not just going to come like that. We've been seeing troubles for the nation of Israel. Hitler, 70 years ago, was one of those times of trouble, which they had never experienced, where 6 million Jews were, were killed at that time. And we may well see more of this as the day is draw, uh, draw near. And said, so by that time, your people will be delivered Everyone whose name will be found in the book. And verse 2 says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. This is the resurrection. Okay? Um, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. You remember? Glorious church, arise, shine, for your light has come. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. <clears throat> until the time of the end. Now look at this. Until the time of the end. What's the next line? Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. That is one sign God gave long time ago. That at the time of the end, two things he mentions here. There will be a lot of movement of people to and fro. And if you look at world history, there's never been a time like the last 50 years that people move to and fro. I mean, I've traveled around the world. I've traveled to over 30 countries, 34 countries around the world. I've been in many airports, some of the busiest airports in the world. It is just incredible. When you see how planes come, you know, there are some airports where planes are lining up in the air. You can see them lining up, you know, taking off. Now, of course, with the COVID-19 situation, travel has been hindered. But you can see this. In our time, we have seen this come to pass. You can be in one part of the world and 24 hours you're in the, at the other end of the world. Um, and then it says knowledge shall increase. And there's never been a time when knowledge has grown exponentially like we've seen in the last uh, 50 years or so. Knowledge every day, every field of endeavor, there's new knowledge coming up. Uh, the pace is just staggering. And so here we see some of the things that indicate that uh, we are living in that age. There are some other things that that uh, indicate uh, for the very first time in the world, we have a communication ability where something that happens in one part of the world can be seen in other parts of the world. In fact, we're now in a very strange situation where something happening in Kampala can first be known by something, somebody happening at the end of the world. And I may be in Kampala and I don't even know what's going on. You know, One time I remember one of those times we arrived in the city, I was working in my office. My brother who lives in Botswana calls me and says, what's happening? Are you people okay? I say, what do you mean, are you okay? He says, I'm looking at the TV. I say, what are you seeing in the TV? So some, those are one of those walk to work riots. And they were seeing these horrible scenes of people being beaten and so on. And I said, look, I'm in my office, I'm okay. <laughs> That's the kind of world we live in now. Uh, and uh, some of the things that are linked with the events at the end time are very, very evident. We now know, for example, also that among the things that are happening now, that is actually possible to mark every human being. That is now very evident to all of us. It's, it's, it is very, very possible to do that. So things that looked very far away are now coming to pass. So we live at that time, but also on the positive side, we're living at a time where I'm talking to you now. I, 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 
I don't know where you are. Some of you are in Kampala. Some of you have logged in from I don't know where. Others have logged in from abroad. So an event that is happening now can be had across the world. I believe like we've come to a very special season and I'd like to, to end with this. Um, before the Reformation 500 years ago, just before the Reformation, a few years before the Reformation, uh, in the 15th century, God allowed something to happen that would lay the platform for the Reformation. That was the, the discovery of the printing press or the invention of the printing press by Johannes Gutenberg in Germany. So when the Reformation now came, uh, the Bible could be easily read because of those days the Bible was not commonly found. And that thing fueled. When Martin Luther on the 31st October 1617 nailed his protest to the church, castle, uh, castle Church at Wittenberg, that news spread like wildfire. Uh, and you can see that scientific advancement, God has allowed the discovery of things like the radio, the steamship, uh, television, all these things have fueled the gospel. Today, God has allowed something else to come to the scene, which the devil is trying to take over, but God is reclaiming very strongly, and that is the internet. The internet is the one of the most powerful tools now, because uh, like now, communication, what I'm sharing now, you'll be watching, some of you are watching, you'll be watching what I'm saying later. The power of the gospel to move around the world in a very short time has never been present in our world like it is today. And uh, <clears throat> we need to be ready for this revolution. Because when Jesus gave us the sign, remember on the Mount of Olives, when he talked about, you know, they had admired the temple and he said, oh, this temple, you see, no stone will be left on top of the other. Then they moved from the temple mount to Mount Olives. And the disciples asked him, when will these things be? And what shall be, when will these things be? When will all these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They asked three questions. So when you read Matthew 24, he's answering all those three questions. But the one answer about the end of the age, he said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the, earth, the whole world, and then the end will come. There is no other generation that has, has the potential we have today to preach the gospel of the kingdom, the very same gospel, to the ends of the earth. And for me, that is one of the biggest signs that we are living in the last days because of the power of television, the power of the internet, uh, the power of what can happen in even a small church like this. Uh, it's not a very small church, by the way, but <laughs> what can happen here going across the world? No other generation has experienced this. And for me, this is one of the mega, mega signs. Uh, there are others as well. There are words, there are hints that Jesus gave when he you know, was told uh, that uh, Herod was looking for him. And he said, go tell that fox Herod that I'll cast out today and tomorrow, I'll cast out demons and then I'll finish my work. He was not talking about these two days. I believe that it was a hint that like a day is a thousand years before the Lord. Could it be, have been hinting about 2,000 years? We are approaching, we are fast approaching the 2,000 year mark since the church was formed, since Jesus died and rose again. Could that have been a hint? In the book of Hosea, it says, chapter 5, chapter 6, Come, let us return to the Lord, uh, and He will heal us. Then it says, after two days, you know, He will restore us. Um, the Jews who had rejected the Lord were now talking prophetically. Hosea, Hosea was talking prophetically about their returning. It says, after two days. Could that have been a hint? Could it? I'm not saying it is, but could it? The Good Samaritan, which is a very good picture of Jesus leaving heaven, coming down, getting man who was half dead, beaten by Satan, putting him in his own donkey, pouring in the oil and the wine, taking him to the innkeeper, who I believe is the Holy Spirit. And the, the, the good Samaritan say, he lives to the Nairai and says, I will return if there's anything more. The picture of the church, mankind being left in the inn, which is the church, the innkeeper is the Holy Spirit. To the Naira is two days work, two days, payment for two days. Could that have been a hint? Many people believe that those were hints. There were hints that this whole church age thing and there are a number of others that we will not go into now. Uh, we may well be that generation that lives around the time of the 2,000 years may well be the generation that sees the signs of the end. There are so many other things happening. So, but let us keep our eyes on the focus. Occupy until I come. Let's not be caught up with all these stories going around. Let us focus on preaching the gospel, extending the frontiers of the kingdom of God in every sphere, in politics, in business, in governance, and going to places where people have not had the gospel before or sponsoring those who go so that this event we are looking forward to of the earth being renewed will come to pass. 
I pray that these words have shone some light and may God richly bless you as you ponder on these words and as we eagerly work for the return of the Lord. God bless you. Amen. <laughs>